So we'll just give just another minute or two for people to kind of settle in um, and I'll tell you just a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, my name is Cynthia B and I am the outreach coordinator here at the Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District. Most of you will know um, us through the garden side of things, which is Conservation Garden Park. And then we are also um, kind of the originators of the idea of local scapes, which is now caught on statewide and classes are happening. We did one on this particular program last month. We did the introduction to local scapes. And that's a design style that we developed. We developed it specifically for Utah to utilize the principles of Xeriscape, but in a way that produces kind of a more moderate um, traditional looking yard that uses 60% less water. So it doesn't look any different than a regular yard, uh, but it performs so much better, uh, particularly in this region. And so uh, we wanted to really simplify that for people and that's where Localscapes is. So Localscapes is kind of the big overview for your entire project, look, jazz hands. The big overview for your entire project, um, but park strips are what we call in our office the gateway drug. Um, it's a great first project. If you're not so sure about this whole thing, you're not really sure you're ready to maintain a lot of change yet, then park strips are a really good kind of low cost, low risk area that you can start transforming your landscape uh, into a more efficient and more regionally appropriate yard. Most of us aren't really, you know, too caught up on having lawn in the park strip, so it's a really great place to start. So, all right, we will go ahead and let's get started talking about how to flip your park strip. I think we are going to. Let's see if we can make that advance. There we go. All right, so right now, our typical front yard, um, Utah has the most beautiful scenery. We are known all over the world um, for the gorgeous scenery that is Utah, and you will see it everywhere except our yards. Um, in our yards, we're in a little bit of zone denial, and um, we're trying really hard to be someplace else. And so what we're hoping to do is move Utah towards a little bit more sustainable position where we can have a lot of the benefits of these other places um, and, and the beauty and the function, but maybe in a way that's just more adapted to our particular region. So the beautiful thing about what we teach that's a little different than what you can learn in other places is that with local scapes, that method was developed to function for yards that have irrigation systems. So anything we are teaching works for anyone whose landscape is watered with an irrigation system. Because once you add that sprinkler system to things, it completely changes everything. Like the regular rules no longer apply because the least flexible part of your entire landscape is, I mean, underground sprinklers. And so we wanna create landscape cell function around that. So we will be talking about that irrigation and for most of you that's still gonna apply. We'll talk in this presentation about how to handle irrigation um, and a few of those other things. So let's get started. So this is the typical yard now. Sorry, I should have shown that. And of course you see that landscape island and I joke that everybody has one and nobody knows why. Um, they just randomly kind of throw one out there because everyone else has it and we're all copying each other and we're all doing it wrong. So um, that's kind of where we are at this point on a general landscape. It's about 90% lawn. And this is where we need to go with the local scape. So it's not that we can't have any lawn. Um, it's that we need to use what we have much smarter. We need to have less of it overall but condensing it all into one usable piece of turf, which is what you're seeing in this local scapes example. And of course the park strip is a piece of that overall um, change and that shift away from being a primarily turf landscape. Now we call this flip your strip. And um, if you're ever you know, posting about it on social or anything, it's hashtag flip your strip. And so this is kind of where we're at. There's lots of different looks. Um, you're seeing on your screen right now, a couple different options. It can be very simple, it can be more complex, you can go with color themes, you can just you know, plant whatever looks interesting to you. Um, there's a lot of variety in there, but what you're seeing, especially look at that middle picture, you can kind of see that lawn behind. The thing that's interesting about lawn in a park strip is when you know, it just kind of visually disappears. So if you're trying to get attention or draw you know, interest into that garden, then a flipped park strip is such a great way to do that. Um, also, because lawn is, well, I think I'm gonna get to that in a minute, here we go. It's almost impossible to water a park strip efficiently. Um, sprinklers weren't really designed to handle um, that really narrow strip efficiently. And so what happens is when we water the park strip, we're actually you know, watering a lot of area. And so what we found through local scapes is kind of the minimum size for any kind of, let me turn this out of the light, there we go. The minimum size for any kind of supplemental irrigation should be eight feet by eight feet. And obviously most park strips aren't going to meet those parameters. 
And so, um, and you can see exactly what's happening here. And this is the shame moment, because this is where I get to admit that's my Mark strap, or at least it used to be before I flipped it. So, so you can see even people that supposedly know what they're doing um, don't always do it right. So this is where I started, and now that has since been flipped and is no longer a problem. But it does show you even design professionals can't make their park strips perfect. Um, we just with trying to keep them on in there, we just need to switch it to something that's going to work better. Um, wrong button. Sorry about that. Oh no, what am I doing? I don't know why I did that. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what's really surprising to most people is that the average park strip is using seven to ten thousand gallons of water per season. And that is kind of an overwhelming number if you think about that. Um, it's just that little strip. But because you've got all of the hot asphalt on one side with the curb and, um, and curb and gutter and sidewalk on the other side, so you've got this little strip down the middle that's really narrow and it gets that heat that's coming off of the lawn or coming off of those hardscape surfaces on either side. And so it's kind of weird to think about, but the lawn in the park strip actually needs more water than the lawn just across the sidewalk in that larger piece of turf there, just because of the extra heat and things that it incurs. Also, for most of us, we have snow in the winter, and so that is the park strips, they're, one of the reasons that they're there is the place to pile the snow we used to get in this climate every winter, and we would pile that snow up in that area, and so, of course, on roadways, they're using salts and things, so there's lots of different problems that come, but it's surprising how much water is used on such a small piece. So when we put the trees in the park strips, depending on the width of the park strip and the size of the tree, and we do want trees um, where it makes sense to have those in park strips to help cool everything down, that's still good. We just wanna make sure they're watered appropriately and given the right area. But when we have trees that don't meet those curriculum, you know, that, those requirements, this is what we end up happening. We get the shallow roots that will break the concrete and lift sidewalks, creating a trip hazard and potential, you know, but just potential problems for people. And of course it is that extreme climate like we talked about. It's just super hot, super dry, and it's very difficult for lawn to thrive there. So you could have this be the way that you know, your, your yard is seen. It doesn't really matter how good anything behind that sidewalk is if the front looks like that, right? So we definitely wanna have a more attractive visual. And this just, a park strip's just an extreme climate. And of course we talked about road salts. Road salts are damaging. A lot of plants do not do well with salt. So anything you plant in a park strip, particularly in a snow area, we definitely want to go with things that are going to be more tolerant of those salts. Now, for those of you that are local in northern Utah, if you receive secondary irrigation water for your property that, that starts at Utah Lake or comes from Utah Lake, Utah Lake is extra salty. And so the, in addition to our alkaline soils, you're going to be adding even more salt through the water. So in those areas, you definitely want to use salt tolerant plants, not just in your park strip, but in the whole landscape. So it's important to look for that particular um, trait for park strip plants. So we also want to create this curb appeal, and that's the difference. So the park strip that you're seeing there, we see the grass that's struggling, trying to survive in the middle of July. And then you can see that park strip behind that was just established. That's a brand new one. It's not quite filled in yet. I think it's in season two. So I should probably go update this photo, including all of the beautiful, you know, infill that it's done since that time. But you can see that it really does draw the eye and create interesting attention. And here's what we found. We call it the gateway drug because it's catchy. It's almost like people are waiting for someone to be first. So if you're on this webinar, I would encourage you to be that first weirdo in your neighborhood that, that flips the park strip and shows how it can be done and how beautiful it can be. And I promise you, if you do it well, you will not be the last. You might be the first, you will definitely not be the last. In fact, we've seen a whole neighborhood in one area where we have our Flip Your Strip program running, which we'll talk about at the end. And we've seen that neighborhood in just three years transition to where there were just a few people with flipped park strips before. And now about 50% of the neighborhood has flipped their park strip just in this one neighbor, just one area. And so the water savings coming out of just that one neighborhood is incredible for something that they weren't really wanting to spend a ton of time on anyway. So this and the curb appeal driving through the neighborhood has definitely improved. So highly encourage that if you want to really draw attention uh, to your landscape. So park strips are typically owned by the city, but you get the joy of paying for the water and maintenance on that particular area. Um, and so you need to check your local regulations and codes. Some cities require street trees and park strips. Some cities don't want you to have street trees and park strips. 
Um, some require rock mulch, some are wanting you to use bark mulch. And so make sure you know what those are. Since the city does own the land, you are you know, kind of beholden to what those requirements are. You'll also wanna check with your HOA um, and see what's required there. And we have made many a presentation to HOAs to get them to change requirements to allow for certain park strip designs. So if your HOA is requiring lawn and you wanna make that change, please email me and I'm happy to give you some ideas on how you can start to make that change happen in your neighborhood as well. So in terms of best practices, we really recommend that you have at least 60% plant coverage at maturity. What we don't want to do is just flip out the lawn and then go with straight gravel or some dead baking hot space um, that you don't necessarily need. And in any climate, even I know we have people from around the region, not just Utah, there are plants that can give you plant coverage, even in our El Paso climate. I know we have some from El Paso or Reno, any of those places, um, but we also want to keep that you know, so we want to get that filled in, but we want to keep it low growing. Safety first. And so um, we want any continuous plants should be uh, shorter than 24 inches. You can have a few accent plants like you see with the yucca there in the photo that might get a little bit taller. But generally speaking, we want to keep that low to the ground so that we can see cyclists on the sidewalks, see children. You can back out of the driveway and have good visual sight, you know, visual distance and see what you're backing into. So, you know, that's kind of it. With the trees, you know, the canopy height needs to be up higher so that you have that same thing. So just think, if I'm seated in a vehicle, do I have adequate visual to see what's going on around me? And that's the key thing to be preserving with those park strips. And here's an example of where that did not happen. Um, actually, and I love hollyhocks, just not in a park strip. And you can see where it creates an extra problem because you see that little crosswalk sign behind there? This is a school crosswalk. So this is an area where children are crossing and then we are blocking the sight of those kids with these, you know, with this beautiful but inappropriately placed plant. So think about that. It's really important that we keep those visual lines open. We also discourage the use of hardscape. So in addition to being places to dump snow in the winter, park strips are generally um, also utility corridors. So it's possible that your park strip will have to be dug up at some point and it's easy to retransplant a plant and just to rake gravel back over. Um, but if you've got this type of material in your park strip, you're going to have some hardships because uh, they don't they don't have to pay to if they move it or whatever. They you know they put the thing back together, but they don't have to pay for new concrete um, or that type of thing when it wasn't what was supposed to be there in the first place. Hence, one of the reasons it's really important to be following your community regulations in your park strip. Um, we do want some hard hard um, surfacing, but typically you're going to use that for pass throughs, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So there's really five steps to reclaiming your park strip. First, we want to plan and design. And we actually even have some free designs that are available, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and then we need to remove the lawn. The third step is to convert any existing sprinklers to drip. And then we want to add that hardscape. Uh, and then, of course, we, then we add the plants there at the end. And it's so hard for people because the plants are the fun part. And you will have spent a good 80% of your budget before you ever even, and, and done all the work too, before you get to that last fun part of plants. And one of the things that I've found over 20 years of teaching these types of classes, I mean, we all just want to skip to the plants, to the frosting. And, you know, I, in fact, I once had someone tell me, I don't want to know all this stuff. Just tell me what to plant. You know, and there is no magic combination of plants. How well our park strips do, how well that investment is protected is all about steps one through four. And once that's completed and done well, then the plants are going to do well because we've given them the right conditions. All right, so let's talk plan and design. Um, so we've got our pathways, plants, and drip irrigation, and then we'll talk a little bit more about plant selection. Okay, so if you go to conservationgardenpark.org and go into our resources section, you can download a bunch of different free park strip plans. They should work for most of you. I think we've planned them primarily for zones three through nine. So they should uh, mostly work for you, and uh, that doesn't you know, require that you come up with your own design. Now you can look at this design here and you can see that that's a 30 foot section. Basically it's plant the 30 feet, rinse and repeat. So you'll just repeat that same thing moving down the park strip. And repetition, because of the way the park strips are viewed as cars are driving by, that repetition becomes really important in order to main, kind of maintain some consistency and attractiveness. All right, so we're gonna remove the existing lawn. So this is the, the next place that we're gonna go. We know what we're gonna do with our design. Now we're gonna work on the lawn. Um, you need to kill the lawn down to the roots. 
And you can do that in a couple of ways. Um, Utah State has some great um, materials on how to do solarization, which is the plastic sheeting that you're seeing above, and how to use the sun to your benefit. We still have enough time left in the summer that you can probably get some pretty good results with solarizing, but obviously that's time of year dependent. It basically bakes the soil and pasteurizes the soil. So it's a natural non-herbicide way to do it, but keep in mind it's also going to negatively impact microbial life in the soil, which it will recover. But I wanna just be clear that just because something is all natural doesn't mean that there are no Ill, potential ill effects from it. And so that's one way that we can do it. Um, like I said, it will recover and solarization is great because it, it kills not only the living plants that you want to die in the park strip, but it also um, pasteurizes that soil and it kills weed seed that's in the soil. With your herbicides, it will kill the plants that are existing, and in this case, you can see the lawn, but it won't do anything about weed seed. So definitely there's just some trade-offs there, and you just need to decide what works for you. And yes, we said the word Roundup in here. Um, sorry, folks, it's still one of the safer chemicals out there. So if you wanna avoid that entirely, that's great. Solarization is your friend. Um, we'll show you a couple other ways to do that as well. But just know that if you don't kill the plants down to the root, um, that you'll have them popping back up. And so that'll be a challenge. Um, once the soil is dead, or you can as you're removing it, sod cutter works great too, because one of the things in a park strip that's a little bit different is you're gonna wanna lower the level of the park strip so that your materials that you mulch with don't fall out onto the sidewalk or roadway. So sod cutters work really good for that purpose because they pull out some of that, um, that material. The downside is you'll still leave some roots in there. So you're still probably gonna wanna, even if you use a sod cutter, you probably still wanna solarize it or wait a little bit of time to let some of that grass kind of resurface so you know how to, to kill that. And then of course you can till it. Now, when you're preparing a bed is the only time we would tell you to actually till anything. Um, every time you till, you're kind of, you know, you're disturbing the soil structure, but you're also bringing up a fresh crop of weed seed. So till it once. If you're going to till, then, then you're going to want to till before you solarize. So sod cut, till, solarize, if in that order, if that's, you know, the direction you want to go without any herbicides. Just make sure that you're marking anything that you, you know, don't want to take out accidentally with the, with the tiller. And of course, always, 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 before you do any digging, call, in our state it's Blue Stakes, but call your utility locating service. It's a free service that's provided. Um, you do not want to run into any kind of utility lines and things. Mostly we're gonna be working pretty shallowly in the park strip, but if you're adding trees or something, then you have the real potential for digging up lines and you don't want anyone getting hurt or you know breaking a gas line or anything scary like that. So know what's going on before you start digging. And that's not just your park strip, that's any part of the yard um, where you're gonna be digging more than just a couple of inches, so. All right, so we removed that existing lawn. We just talked about how it's important to bring that down below that level of sidewalk um, so that you can have that space and your mulch will not be falling off your park strip. And so that's the next step. We're gonna bring that in and retain, retain those materials. Um, some cities, I said earlier, well, I guess we'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, sorry about this. This is gonna make you dizzy. Um, <laughs> there's two types of drip irrigation that you can use. So we've got this inline drip that you see above. Um, one of the brand names for that that we've often used is Netafem, but it's that type of drip. And it looks like there's just a hole there in that emitter, but actually there's a little cartridge behind it that prevents bugs from getting in and, and um, helps allow that water to leak out. And then the second type is point source drip. Um, you need to use one or the other of these systems um, for your park strip. If you're gonna plant more densely than inline, if you're going to have just a few plants, then point source is fine. But drip irrigation is key for a couple of reasons, and the main one just being that it's just going to water the plants you wanna keep and not obnoxious weeds. So one of the advantages we have here in the West over folks say like in Kansas City, I know we have a Kansas City person on today, um, is that because we get so little annual rainfall, we actually get to take control of one of the things that's causing weeds, and that's the water. And so if you wanna control weeds, you've gotta control water. And we wanna just be applying that water to the plants we're trying to keep. All right, so here's an example. We'll see this park strip. This is one of my favorite park strips. So it's prejudiced, but I love it. It's in here a lot. Um, so we were gonna see that. So you can see how that inline drip works. It's best to have at least three rows in a park strip. This is your standard five foot wide park strip that you're seeing right here. Obviously, if you have a wider park strip, that's more. You can install it kind of free form like you see here, or you can do it in very formal grids. Um, our staff here at the Conservation Garden Park tends to cut a two by four 
to the spacing width they want. In sandy soil, that will be a 12 inch spacing. And in um, more clay soils, that'll be 18 inch spacing. And you can buy drip, the, the inline drip in both of those spacing requirements. And that's all about how water is saturating the soil. So although you see the water on top of the soil here, this is newly planted, tiny little sedums. Um, it looks like it's just barely you know, applying it there, but it does spread out a little bit more underground. But that'll give you a pretty good idea. Um, a lot of times what I like to do is to run the drip line first and then plant so that I'm making sure to plant where I can, um, plant my plants right in front of an emitter. And then that actually helps me space my plants as well. So, you know, that's just kind of a personal way to do that. But um, inline drip is probably my preferred method because I like dense plantings. I like dense plantings because I don't like to spend more time maintaining than I have to. I want the biggest bang for my least amount of investment of time. And so a more dense park strip will give me that. Um, okay, so let's talk irrigation for a minute because irrigation can be a little overwhelming. In good news, there are new products that really help. Now, if you're doing a brand new yard, um, then it's really easy to create drip zones at the beginning of a sprinkler system install. So you can see that sprinkler valve there on the left, and that's the type that's used for spray heads. Um, and then right after that valve, you can see here that we've got a little add-on part that's for drip irrigation. And what that does is it reduces the pressure that's going into the drip lines. They don't need to operate as, at as high a pressure as, an, as a sprinkler would. And then it also filters in case there's any weed seed or things like that that could clog the drip lines. So it's kind of a, it's not the only filter on the system, but it's kind of that last filter before it enters um, that little ecosystem. So here you can see how that's set up. So you can see that little filter part. And then you can see that pressure reducer that's built in, and then, the, then it goes out to about 40 PSI to serve those drip lines. So drip applies water low and slow so that the water soaks into the ground instead of reaching the saturation point and running off. And that's much better. It helps force that water deeper where your plant roots can make better use of it. Um, there are other types of retrofit heads. There's kind of the, the spaceship head that you see here, that first one. And um, that one is fine, and then it has spaghetti tubing that comes out from it, but I don't know, it looks a little messier. Our preference is the second one that you see here, and that's, that is uh, made by Rainbird, and it is a retrofit head. And if you look at the body of that, you'll see that it looks substantially like your sprinkler already looks in the, in the system. Oh, hang on. So it really can just replace your existing sprinkler. So you can either... Um, unattach your sprinkler there at the base. You can see where it kind of hooks into the line there at the bottom and put this whole part on. Or if the top works, you can unscrew the top of your existing sprinkler, pull the guts out of the sprinkler, then open the top of this retrofit head, put the, pre put the filter inside the sprinkler body where the springs used to be. The pressure reducer is in the new head. You can screw that on and away you go and you've dropped the pressure right there at the, um, at the head, and you may not have to do any digging. Um, the key is that you will have to convert the entire zone. So let's look at what that looks like. So here's an existing one. We've got that spray pattern, and we're spraying over onto the road. Um, of course, it's got the head-to-head -head coverage, so that's why you're seeing each of those circles lap to each one, and that's important anytime you're using overhead spray. It, the way it gets its coverage isn't just from one sprinkler, it's from those two sprinklers overlapping. And so getting that head-to-head -head coverage. And usually when you're seeing brown spots, it's because you have insufficient coverage. And if you're seeing mushrooms, a lot of times it's because you might have, you know, three or four heads that are overlapping in some area that's, that's creating too much of a wet spot. Our goal with local scapes is actually to simplify the shapes of lawn and the way that we're using lawn so that you get fewer problem points. Um, and so this plays into that same thing. So here's where we're at right now. All right, so you don't have to dig up all the old pipe to convert it. If you look at the little um, coral colored dots there, that's those retrofit heads that we talked about. Now you can get away, so in the longer section of Park Strip, you can see that we've used one on either end. You could just use one, but then if there, a clog or something happens in your drip line, then the water is blocked and it doesn't continue where it needs to go. If you hook it on both ends, then the water can go, you know, can work its way around. And even if it's clogged in one direction, it can um, still circulate from the other direction. And so we recommend that. And then you buy a special cap that you can put on your existing sprinkler heads. So you can either just unscrew the top and put the new cap on, or if you want, you can unscrew the sprinkler, you know, dig down, unscrew it at the base and cap it off down below grade. It's up to you. Um, 
either way will work. Okay, so then let's look at how that conversion lines up. So here in that little circle inset, you can see a valve, a typical valve in the valve box. So, um, and I think that's got the, yeah, that's got the pressure reducer and things on it already. And then we're bringing that line out to the park strip. Ideally, your park strip should be on its own sprinkler zone. Um, even if your park strip were lawn, that would still be important because um, your lawn across the sidewalk, like we talked about earlier, is going to need less water than the park strip does. So you, if you keep them on the same zone, you won't be able to make them both happy. Um, and so in this particular case, you can see that we actually have that going on. This zone is covering the park strip, but it's also covering that section of the lawn. So we need to add a new drip line. And so um, what we do here is we're gonna cap those heads and we've added the drip line above grade. You can just um, not worry about the pipe that's underground, just cap it off. You don't have to dig it up and you can just abandon that as long as you, you know, have closed it off. And then um, you can see we've still got that spray zone that we're gonna need to, to keep those on a spray zone. So we've added a whole new zone. So there's now two valves in the valve box. This is probably the ideal way to do it, but it's also a little bit harder because you're gonna have to dig and I, hate working in valve boxes, so this, but this is the most perfect way to do it. Um, the other way to do it is with that retrofit kit that we talked about earlier. So if you don't wanna have to dig all of that up, then utilize those kits. And we do have here at the Conservation Garden Park, hopefully we'll get that class online. We have an entire irrigation class where we lay out a fake sprinkler system with all of the parts and then we walk through it and show you how all of those things connect and how they go together. Um, once you've seen it and played with it a little bit, it's not so intimidating, but irrigation can be an intimidating thing for most homeowners until you get some experience. So we're happy to help out in that regard. Okay, let's say you have mature trees in the park strip and we want to retain those. We want to keep that shade and that, you know, that attractiveness. So the key is that your new plants are going to need less water, but your trees are going to need a little bit more. And so one of the challenges that cities have seen when people flip the park strip is that they, um, they're not putting enough water at the root areas of the tree at the drip line. And so the trees start to decline in health and then they're more susceptible to diseases and all sorts of problems because they're getting underwatered. And so you definitely need to still make sure that's the case. And so look at your, um, the edge of the tree kind of tells you where that drip line zone is. Um, and so, yeah, they're gonna still need water under that canopy that you're seeing there once we've removed the lawn and we wanna plan for that in our irrigation stage. So we're going to install that inline drip irrigation in those areas for sure, because we wanna have water kind of spreading out where all the roots are. Um, if we only use like a point source here and are only applying water in just a couple of spots, what will end up happening is your tree will kind of get out of balance because the, the roots are gonna grow where the water is. So if we use the drip, and I'll show you a better photo of what that looks like in a little bit, um, then it's really more evenly spreading that water across that area and helping the roots on all the way around the tree get what they need so that we're creating trees that are deeply rooted and strong in that park strip. So here's what it looks like. Now, when you can do it this way, this is perfect. If your park strip is wide enough to do the double circle, there's about 18 inches of distance between those. Um, if your park strip isn't wide enough, then do a double square and that will still work to get the, um, the additional water in there. Use about 18 inches, pull it 18 inches away from the trunk of the tree for that first, uh, maybe 12 to 18 inches for that first ring, and then that second ring is 12 to 18 inches you know, from the first, and again, it depends on your soil. Sandy soil uses closer spacing, clay soil uses farther spacing, and um, this is typically adequate to keep your trees watered and happy. Uh, your shrubs might need a single ring, if you're just doing shrubs in the park strip, they might need a single ring. So you can see the tree has the double. Do a single ring for the shrub, about at least you know eight, nine inches from the base of the shrub. And then um, for perennials, they just need to be by a single emitter. So they've got one source of water and that's enough for them. And grasses are the same way. All right, so let's talk about adding hardscape. So hardscape is important in a park strip just because this is, you know, people are, you know, parking there. So we wanna be able to get them through the park strip and to the property in a way that's adequate. Um, obviously the first example is a much cleaner, easier way to do that than the second, but both of these work. And what I tell people when you need to locate, you know, where to put those pass-throughs, take your vehicles, park them against the curb where anyone visiting your home would park, open the doors, and now you know where your pass-throughs need to go and what size to make them so that it's still gonna function for the purposes. And so, yeah, we want safe passage. 
And especially if you know you're gonna have things that trip. Notice the size of the stone there in the bottom photo. You can see that there's creeping time that's surrounding it, which always looks really cool. But whenever you have a stepping stone with ground cover surrounding it, just know you're gonna lose about six inches of the stone anywhere that ground cover kind of fluffs over that edge. And so what happens a lot of times is we buy smaller stones because it's more cost effective, but then if we plant the ground cover in between them, we don't end up with a safe stepping surface. So we wanna make sure that at the end of that, it's going to be safe once the plants fill in. And then we don't have to put plants in between. Here's a kind of a hybrid approach here. You can see the flagstone. Um, the rock that's in between there is um, a Utah product called flagstone chip. Other places will call it chat, uh, decomposed granite. In, it's kind of like road base, but not quite. So it has the crushed stone, but it also has really nice fine particles in it that can be used to kind of compact together. Um, there's also a type of sand that you can get called polymeric sand, which when it's dry, it's solid. And then when it's wet, it allows water to permeate. So any of those things in between your um, stones and things work really well. But we want it to kind of be permeable to water and air if you're going to, to do that hardscape in the park strip. It's just the ideal way to do that. And again, if you had to dig this out and put it back in, it's a pain, but it's not money lost. You know, you're not losing your, your investment. Very rare is your park strip dug up, but if you want to ensure that it happens, go ahead and put some really expensive stamped concrete in there and you will kick in Murphy's Law. <laughs> you're not tried in the ways you're prepared to handle. Okay, so then when you're gonna run that drip line, so we showed you, hang on, we're gonna go back one. So you can see this right here on the surface, underneath that, because you've got planting bed on either side of that pass through, and here's what it looks like underneath. So they actually put a piece of conduit. So could you just run the drip line under there? Yes, but if you have a problem with your drip line, you're toast. So what we wanna do instead is run a one inch, maybe even a little bit, inch and a half piece of PVC pipe underneath your hardscaped area, and then run your drip line through that pipe. And then if there's a problem and you dig up the drip line, you can fish it out, you can you know, put it back through the pipe and you just made your life much easier for the investment of a couple of bucks and you know, three extra minutes of labor. So we definitely recommend that you do it that way and that also protects the tubing from being punctured and things underneath. What we don't wanna have happen is we don't wanna have a leak um, in a place that it's not only hard to fix but also hard to identify that we even have one. Um, so hardscape material should be at least three feet away from your trees. So you can see that that's been done here. Of course, that's a pretty narrow pass through in that section, but you can see on the other side. So we keep that well, you know, well away from those trees and that will also help maintain the health of the tree, and the quality of the landscape. And then one of my favorite things that this particular picture does is that it repeats some of those park strip plants um, and just the feeling of that park strip on the opposite side. And that also helps create a sense of separation from the street for the home. So if you live on a busier street, I would absolutely double it like this so that you're creating that distance. Also notice how that fence is set back from the edge of the sidewalk a little bit. Um, don't ever put a, a, if you're gonna do a fencing in the front yard, don't ever put it right next to the sidewalk. Always give yourself at least two feet of space, um, just as false space in case someone falls off a bike or whatever else, it's just a liability thing. But it's also far more attractive. See how that fence creates a, consistent element that's a backdrop for those plants. So it just cr creates really clean organization. One of the biggest complaints we hear about xeriscaping um, from homeowners is just the idea that it looks messy and unorganized. And when you don't have lawn to serve that, ele that organizing element, you've got to really rely on some of these other things to create that sense of um, intention and you know, cleanness. This is a very clean design, it looks great. Um, okay, so now we can talk plants. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the frosting. We talked about all the hard parts. So let's talk about the reward that you get for doing those hard parts. Um, plants should be compact and tough and water-wise and whatever that means in your climate. Um, here at the Conservation Garden Park, we do have a plant database online. If you go to conservationgardenpark.org backslash plants and um, any plant we are growing here in our eight acre garden is listed on that website. And um, I believe we are just updating it now so that you can search by deer resistance, salt tolerance, and I think you can specifically search by park strip. So um, we're trying to make that database even more useful. Also, there's a really great book from the USU Extension that just got reprinted due to popular demand called Combinations for Conservation. And they have a lot of great plants in there. Some of the same ones that we have in our database that will really show you what your options are um, for just, not just nice plants to use, which I'm going to show you, but the Com Combinations for Conservation book also shows you how to combine those things 
uh, in attractive ways. So it gives you kind of that extra step as well. Um, we do discourage you from removing any healthy, mature trees that are existing. So if it's a sad, sick tree, go ahead and pull it out. Um, but if it's a healthy tree that's serving a purpose, you do not need to remove it to flip your park strip. In fact, we want you to keep it. All right, so low density. Now here's the, here's the quiz question, you ready? Which one of these park strips is the most difficult to maintain? I need like little timer music. Um, it's actually the low density park strip. So it looks like that's the easiest, but here's the thing. If you notice, there's lots of open space. So wherever there's open space, there's sunlight and wherever sunlight gets to the soil, you have a greater chance of weed seed germinating. Um, and if you get a weed and you have a low density park strip, it's really obvious that something's out of sync. When you do a mixed density park strip, which you see here in the middle, you have areas that are very thickly planted and then areas where there's, where there's nothing, but overall you have 60% minimum plant coverage. And then of course there's the high density. Um, the high density that you see here is just kind of a riot of different colors and interest going on. And even if there were a weed in there, you would not see it. So um, where we find the easiest maintenance seems to be in things that have no plants and things that have lots of plants, but low plants can be a little harder. That said, if you're one of those people that's really good about if you see a weed, you pull it. Um, and let me just say that every really great maintained yard of the people that I've talked to, that's exactly what they do. They walk the yard for five minutes a day, five minutes. If they see a weed, they just pull it right then and they're done. Um, there are procrastinators like me who wait six weeks and then I'm pulling, you know, quite a few more than, than that. So um, it's just up to you. Know yourself and what your style is and what will work for you. Mulch is really, really critical in any planting bed. Um, it serves a couple of functions. So, and when we say mulch, we don't just mean like, I'm gonna put a skiff of stuff down to make the soil look brown. We mean that mulch is serving a really important purpose in that planting bed. And so that three, it should be three to four inches. Now, if it's rock, it can be a little less, but um, what it does is it helps retain soil moisture and it reduces the weeds. And in terms of which material you use, that's really up to you. Um, like I said, we don't have a specific thing that we say that it has to be in park strips, but you may check your city because like, I, um, like some cities I know don't allow for bark or compost because that gets into the storm sewer and they call it floatables and it will clog up the storm sewers. And so they want more rock or hardscape. Other cities, you know, they may not want that. If you're worried about kids picking up rocks and throwing rocks, then your best of both worlds would be that chat decomposed granite flagstone chip stuff because it's really fine, so it's not big enough to do a lot of damage, but it also still gives you that other benefit. The other nice thing about that, that type of material is that it can be compacted. So if it's part of your walkway pass-through, you can rent a plate compactor, and you can, even though it's permeable for air and water, you can get it to pack pretty tightly, uh, and that works out great. All right, let's talk maintenance for a moment. So new plants really can't go without water for very long. Even native plants are going to need extra water in order to get those root systems to establish. So um, we're gonna water every other day for the first couple of weeks. And then um, after the first two weeks, you can kind of scale that back. And then by the next year, you know, you'll be down to um, once or twice, well, once a week if you've got kind of standard plants and maybe once or twice a month if you've got more of the native plants. And if you're in other climates, You'll just have to take your local advice from your local experts on what your watering frequency should be. Um, but the key is that we want to water them deeply and infrequently. And that's why the drip irrigation works so well. Because overhead spray is exactly the opposite. It waters shallowly and it waters a lot, you know, very, in a very short window of time. And so we want to do that completely opposite for park strips. Um, and so with that drip irrigation, we usually it goes about once a week for about an hour. So it's very slowly, slowly adding the water, letting the soil absorb it so that any water we're adding is not running off. We want to avoid runoff. Use what you need, but not any more than you need. And that's the key. Now, for those of you in wetter climates, you might also use your park strip as a rain garden. So you can see we've got this kind of flat and level here just because, I mean, this year was the first time we got over 20 inches of rain. I think there's only been four instances of that since 1874, and this was one of those years. So this year, a rain garden would have even worked for us, but typically, you know, we're not getting so much rain that that's a problem, but in other places it is, and park strips are a great place to kind of bring that down a little bit and create an area to hold that water and let it absorb 
um, so everything's not just running off into that storm drain and that you can keep that water watering your plants. Okay, mistakes that we see. Um, if you water the park strip plants the very same as the lawn, you're just growing weeds. So one of the challenges that I've found in teaching these classes over the years is trying to explain to homeowners that the reason you're getting weeds is your cultivation practices. It's not just the fact that if you have planting veg, you'll have tons of weeds. You will get weeds. I mean, that's inevitable. I, if I had the recipe for never, you know, not using chemicals and never having weeds again, I would be super rich and I would not be giving this webinar. Um, but there is no magic bullet. So we're getting you as close to no maintenance as we can here. So what we want to do is keep the lawn watered on its own zone, watered in the way that works for lawn, and putting lawn in that configuration that is easy to water in the first place. So getting rid of all the bits and bobs, awkward narrow spots, those types of things. And then um, we want to, so the maintenance mistakes we're seeing is when people are watering, just like you're seeing here, where they're watering them the same way. Um, also, you can see the annuals in the planting bed. We only recommend that you use annuals in containers because uh, they're kind of a specialty thing. And if you have them in the planting bed, they're gonna need way more water than the rest of your plants. Um, okay, and then we also wanna make sure that one of the big mistakes we see is just not using mulch. Um, we wanna shade the soil with mulch. We want to hold the water that gets into our soil. We want to keep it there and not let it just evaporate. So it's not just how much water we're applying. It's being able to retain that moisture in the soil for as long as we can. And then, of course, we want that mulch to shade out those weeds and not let that weed seed get the sunlight that it needs to germinate. So we call this the local scapes weed control recipe. It's the closest to a magic bullet as you're going to be able to get for controlling weeds. And there you go. So three to four inches of mulch avoid the compaction or disruption. Like once you've got that bed prepared and once you've tilled it that one time, don't till it again. You know, then we just work on it after that. And if you've done these first four things, your need for chemicals should be minimized. Um, and then of course, if you're willing to hand weed, then you can eliminate those chemicals. We've, we're not anti-chemical, but boy, most people use way too much. It should never be your first go-to. It should be the thing that you do after you've done the other things. And if you're doing items one through four, your need for chemicals should be minor compared to someone that's doing, you know, the maintenance mistakes that we saw previously. Okay, here's the controversial piece. We do not recommend weed barrier fabric in a park strip. And in fact, we don't even like to call it weed barrier fabric because anyone who's had it for more than three seasons knows there's no, it, it does not do that job. Uh, we call it landscape fabric and its purpose is to keep the layers separate. So its purpose would be to keep your rock mulch separate from your, you know, your ground material if you're doing a path, for example. So the only place we would recommend that you use weed barrier fabric is in unplanted areas because it harms the soil. Um, it only works temporarily on weeds. You're still gonna get weed seed blowing in on top from other places and then that weed seed germinates, works its way into the fabric and you pull it and it rips the fabric and now you're ending up being, you know, weed barrier whack-a-mole trying to shove it back under the mulch and it's ripping up in places and it's just a mess. The worst job that any of our seasonal staff does here at Conservation Garden Park is removing old weed barrier fabric. So this is a lesson we learned the hard way. There is no weed pulling that is worse than removing weed barrier fabric. So just, just don't go there. All right, now let's talk plants. So the big secret to a gorgeous landscape is not in the blooms, it's in the foliage. Blooms are your bonus. And so if you look at this particular one here, the only thing blooming is that wild geranium. And yet this entire planted area is just vivid with color and shape and texture. That's what we're talking about. And that's a pretty nice little pass through there too. This is an extra wide park strip in Salt Lake City. It's like a 20 foot wide park strip. It's bigger than their front yard. So, you know, here's a great way to utilize that space. Uh, another key um, is to repeat colors. So you can see that here. Now there's, you know, there, I probably wouldn't put roses in the park strip if it were me, but you can kind of get the same idea with the red flowers and you can see those different color things that are used. And again, you can see how attractive it is when you carry the, the, the same idea of planting on both sides of the sidewalk. You really make the best pedestrian experience. And as cars are driving by, it's really more important to have that repetition and order in a park strip than it might be in other parts of the yard. All right, full sun favorites. If I had only one plant in my entire yard, only one perennial that could bloom, it would be this one. There's even a variety called Soul Dancer that was introduced by Utah State Extension's uh, Sago Supreme Program. Awesome plant. This will bloom almost nonstop from April, late April, clear through. We've had it blooming as late as December up here. I know down south in southern Utah, down in the hotter parts of the state, 
Um, the bloom season's even longer. We do not deadhead it. It just is always happy with the yellow blooms and it has really nice, tidy foliage, which is sometimes a problem with um, some of our natives. So awesome, awesome plant. Chocolate flower, yes, it does smell like chocolate. And um, so that one will reseed a little bit. So it's a, it's a great perennial. It'll bloom on and off all season long. Still nice and low growing and you know, smells like chocolate. So what's not to love? Penstemon. Um, Utah is home to more native species of penstemon than anywhere else in the world, and they come in literally every color of the rainbow. Firecracker penstemon is a particular favorite. It's really showy in the park strip, so if you want to go hot colors, this one's your friend. Uh, Mexican hat, that's a little bit more of a prairie plant, so our, uh, our watcher from Kansas City, this is for you. And, um, but it works great here too. So this is another one that doesn't need a lot of extra inputs from you, and it will do a little bit of reseeding, and it will give you a much more, so we're, doesn't want a casual look, this is a more casual uh, perennial. Again, here's just a mix of penstemon. These are just the selected varieties. It's called the um, Rondo mix, but they're, they're not GMO or anything. They're just, uh, it's just a selected mix of penstemons. And again, here we go. This is just more of the colors that are available in that particular plant. They bloom heavily and very showy. In the fall, we have fire chalice. And so this is kind of like, it's almost, it looks a lot like the penstemon, obviously a different plant, but it does really well um, late summer. So it started blooming now and it will bloom clear into um, till we get a hard frost. So there's your end of season bloomers. Comes in kind of orange red. And now you're starting to find some kind of pinky coral colors as well. Um, that can be pretty hardy, so those are awesome. Now, okay, hummingbird mint, yes, but not just any hummingbird mint. There are super tall varieties that are too tall, goes back to the hollyhock problem, but there are also some newer varieties, particularly like the Kudos series, that are dwarf. And not only are they dwarf, but they're very prolifically blooming. So I would definitely recommend um, that particular plant as a great option, and it comes in lots of different warm colors. Um, cat mints are going to give you that same low spreading and they're going to bloom off and on all season. So they'll bloom most heavily in spring and then it will repeat bloom later in the season. And they do attract cats, true to their name. Um, that's why mine had a bald spot. I didn't know why. And then I went out one day and found my 20 pound cat lolling upside down in it. So if you do not want to attract cats, you do not want cat mint. Um, blue oat grass is a really great low growing grass. You can see that color. So the beautiful color and foliage texture, I love grasses, particularly here in the West. It's just so natural to our environment. Um, same with the Midwest, but you can see the beautiful seed heads, they catch light, they add movement, even a nice rustling sound. Um, every yard should have a bunch of different kinds of ornamental grass, and this is a great one for the park strip. Okay, let's talk shade. So if you have those mature trees that we talked about earlier and you're not gonna be removing them, let's look at what works for those shade those shady areas. So if you want to just kind of mimic the look of lawn, there are different sedges that will work. Our, um, we tested a bunch and you can see those here. And for us, the winner came out as blue zinger sedge was the hardiest to serve this purpose. We do not mow this. Um, we just let it do what it's doing. So if you want kind of that lawn look and you don't mind a little bit of shagginess, this one will work for you. Um, if you need something that is evergreen, this is a great option, very salt tolerant, and that's the um, bearberry. There are very few broadleaf evergreens that are drought tolerant, and this is one of them. And the reason is because our drying winds here in Utah work their way across the foliage through the winter and just they, they suck the life out of the plant. They just literally dry the plant out. And so it doesn't die because it gets too cold. It dies because it gets too dry. So this is an option that will not cause that same problem. Um, I love dead nettle. It serves so many great purposes for dry shade. Here you're seeing kind of the white and green version and going back to what we talked about with you know, the magic being foliage color, there's also a, a gold leaf variety. And the heavier shade you have, the more these light colored foliage really pop and they glow in that shady um, location. Uh, hardy geranium is always a winner. There are so many varieties of this depending on where you live. And it's that low spreading, it's very loose. Um, one of the things I like to do with this plant is if I'm gonna plant bulbs, I'll dig a nice hole, I'll plop like 12 tulip bulbs in it, cover the hole over and pop one of these on top. Because what happens is those tulip bulbs will come up in the spring and I'll have my tulips. And then once the foliage starts looking ugly, that's when the geranium comes out and it fills in and it kind of hides, it works its way around, it's very loose perennial. And so then it hides kind of that unattractive tulip foliage. So it's a great way to do it if you want to add some bulbs to the park strip as well. 
Plumbago is probably my favorite ground cover. It's gently spreading enough to be, you know, enough to kind of fill in, but not so much that you regret it. That's the biggest challenge with ground covers is we plant them because we want them to fill in space and then we hate them because they fill in space. So, and you can see the fall color on that. So you get literally cobalt blue flowers, which as you all know is rare. And then in the fall, as soon as the temperatures start dropping, you'll get this gorgeous foliage color. Okay, so let's go with park strips. And I will be staying to answer questions at the end of this too. So sorry, I know some of you are asking questions. I just wanna get the people out the door that need to get out the door. So trees for park strips, um, golden rain tree. If you're in a narrow area, there's a new one, I think it's called golden candle. There is a columnar version of, rain of this golden rain tree. Super salt tolerant, hardy, a little messy, but it works. Um, if you want on the opposite side of that, if you want something that's got a little cleaner lines and a little more formal, regular shape, little leaf linden is your friend. Um, hackberries, that's for maybe if you've got a little bit wider park strip and you want a taller, larger tree to provide more shade. They're more of an irregular tree, but they are very, very tough. Just don't use them if you've got, you know, utility lines and things because they will get 50 feet tall. Um, Zelkovas are a favorite for us, particularly as a replacement for a lot of the more popular maples that don't do well here, like the sugar maples don't do well in Utah. Um, Zelkovas give you a lot of the same kind of shapes as those maples without the problems. Um, City Sprite in particular is a small compact tree, so it works really well. Good to use under utility lines. Um, Ivory Silk Lilac is an awesome tree for blooms, and one of the neat things about it is it blooms after all the other spring blooming trees. So your, your lilac care is going to bloom like late, late May, early June in northern Utah, and so it just keeps extending the, the tree flowering season, but as you can see, it's beautiful and it's very tough, and it's not as common, so that's kind of fun too. Um, spring Snow Crab Apple does not have fruits, so we want to avoid anything with fruits in a park strip because the cleanup is a nightmare. And uh, the spring snow is fruitless. It has a very nice sweet scent, beautiful flowers. We recommend this instead of any of the flowering pear trees. Flowering pear trees have been really overplanted. They've got some problems with real wood still. And um, here in Utah, we've got a lot of fire blight that's going on. And so that just, because those trees are overplanted, it's just running rampant through them and they're really, really prone to disease. So we're recommending these are a little bit hardier and less common, so we recommend that this is a good replacement if you really wanted that pair. All right, so let's just look at a few inspiration photos of ideas, and these are all local and just things that other people have done. So you can see the park strip here is just blue oak grass and a few perennials, um, and it looks like a Zalkova. So very simple. And I wanted to show you too, um, you know, that was planted, so the first park strip there, that picture was taking, taken, I think, at like late September early October, and you can see that not even a year later, they achieved almost complete coverage. That's just a different, uh, that's just a mix of different foliage colored sedums. I think they have four different kinds of sedum in there, and they just kind of intermixed it to create this beautiful tapestry. It can be very simple. This is just trees, and then this is a different kind of sedum there, and you can kind of see they've got a little bit of texture going on with the rock. So it doesn't have to be fancy, but we do want to get that 60% plant coverage. Another very simple example, I know, okay, junipers get kind of a bum rap here in Utah because if you're like me and you grew up in the 70s and 80s, they actually had a lot of them in Park Strip, but they had the wrong ones. They had the like four foot tall ones. And if you ever fell off your bike and tackled with one, you, you know what I'm talking about, the bumps and everything, it's misery. But there are varieties of juniper that do deserve a place in your Park Strip. And that's typically the horizontal juniper, um, which it gets just a couple of inches tall, stays really low to the ground and fills in and it serves a really important function of giving you green at the ground plane level. And the less lawn you have, the more important it is to replace that look with this greenery at ground level. And so uh, horizontal junipers are a low cost way to really um, you know, they'll spread quite a bit to really make that happen. Um, so here we go. So we have just a mix of ground covers and shrubs here. So you can see there's just a few different things. This is just very simple um, options. Go with the color themed herbs are great for park strips. Um, especially, I love lavender because it kind of fills out to about the right size, but also as you walk by, if you brush it, you'll release that fragrance, which is great. So maybe avoid the stinky herbs in the park strip, but some of these great smelling ones are awesome. And then this is the user experience. So when we talk about creating attractive communities, and I, when people tell me, well, I have to have lawn or our neighborhoods won't be pretty, I like to show them this picture. What is the most prominent thing that you see in the left-hand side? 
your eye immediately goes to those green cable boxes. So congratulations, we do have beautiful lawn, but there's so much of it that it disappears. And so if everybody's special, nobody's special. In our high west dry climates, lawn is special and should be treated that way. And it should be used with intention and not as just a generic ground cover. We have all these other beautiful plants that can give us interest and texture and don't need so much from us. So it just makes far more sense to do that and it makes for better communities. Okay, so if you wanna learn more, Conservation Garden Park, we are on Facebook. Um, in fact, if you interact, I do run our social media. So if you're interacting on Facebook, you're most often interacting with me or with Corey at the front desk uh, on our social accounts. Visit with us here in the garden. We've got awesome seasonal staff, usually sourced from Utah State. Uh, occasionally we let those BYU people in. But uh, we have wonderful seasonal staff that can help you as you visit the garden and know how to use these things. We do have other gardens throughout the state that are conservation gardens that are set up similarly. And we're all here to help you. So that's what we'd love to see you do. All right. Cool. That was awesome. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay. And we don't need to go into that program. So we'll just go, we'll just leave it right there. Okay, cool. That was awesome, guys. Thank you all for your participation. Cynthia, thank you so much. For thank you. I appreciate it. And hopefully we see everyone next month when we chat about plants. We'll see you Have next. a great day.